I will, I, I'd like to focus on the, uh, the challenges of conducting uh, clinical trials, but maybe also highlight some opportunities, because I don't think this should be a negative uh, presentation. It is difficult, but it is feasible. That's uh, basically the message. And I'd like to talk about the scientific challenges, some operational challenges, of course, and then some regulatory ethical challenges. So probably things you already know, I'll, I'll go quickly, maybe it will uh, help to give uh, another breathing to the, to the meeting, which has been really uh, superb in science. So the context of, of what we are talking about again is, of course, we're talking neglected diseases, and what we are talking about is diseases, uh, uh, poverty-related diseases. And this uh, map shows you the darker the, uh, the color in the upper, um, upper chart is uh, the numbers of uh, NTDs uh, by country, and below the darker is the uh, darker uh, the uh, increased poverty. Uh, burden in that country, and you can see there is clearly a, an overlap here. So we are, we are. Uh, the context is really working in in poor countries, essentially. So this morning we heard about the uh, the review that uh, DNDI and MSF had conducted about the assessment of what was the uh, the portfolio and the outcome of uh, of uh, products uh, between. Uh, until 2002, and what we decided to do is a review of uh, what had come after uh, the start of the initiation of the PDPs and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other big donors or uh, institutions, uh, including EDCTP, and see how much that had resulted in some changes, as was presented this morning. So. Um, we did that, we, we looked at the past, we looked at what had been produced during that decade, but we also tried to predict what would be coming by looking, one indicator, the one we chose was to look at clinical trials and essentially looking at clinical trials from phase one to phase three, which we felt were reflecting some active research and not beyond that because that would be trials in uh, looking at phase four like trials, so um, not reflecting what was going to come. Um, so this is the, uh, the methodology and we took a snapshot uh, in December of 2011 and just looked at mapped all the clinical trials. And you can see here the results. So uh, we included a number of databases, uh, of course, the clinical trials database, but also the WHO registry, which has the individual uh, databases from different countries. Basically, and this is a constant number in that publication, it's a, around 1% of, uh, of clinical trials were assessing uh, products aiming at treating uh, neglected diseases. That is very low. And um, even though I think we've been discussing, uh, you know, the lack of incentives, there's been some progress, but I, I think we can say that the, the difficulties are still here. So let's try and see uh, outside of the, uh, the difficulty related to finding access and to finding compounds, are there anything that, is really, you know, that relates to the, uh, the conduct of these uh, clinical trials? So in terms of uh, scientific challenges, I'll just highlight uh, three with some overlap and start with a, a developing a new compound that Alan mentioned this morning, uh, which is fexinidazole, a nitroimidazole developed for sleeping sickness, stage two sleeping sickness. So that disease is fatal. There is a treatment that's there that has super high efficacy of 94%, but it is absolutely not adapted to all the patients we would like to treat because it still requires some infusions at hospital. So DNDI has engaged in developing an oral treatment, fexinidazole. So how do you do that? Well, that's where it starts being difficult. Uh, of course, you would like to be able to have uh, quick uh, proof of concept studies that would indicate, you know, if you have a uh, you have something with your drug. It's not feasible for a number of reasons because uh, you, you have this high efficacy, so you cannot use placebo, you cannot do non-inferiority with a low number of patients, and we have a super long follow-up. So basically having a short proof of concept uh, uh, revealed impossible. Uh, you cannot do double blind uh, in these uh, regions. This is in DRC or Congo because you have uh, 
well, first of all, it would be difficult because of the active uh, comparator, which is, again, a, a combination of uh, injection, injections and oral treatment. And plus, uh, looking at the pharmacies there, I mean, it would be so huge. So uh, anyway, another difficulty. Guidelines exist, and that is very unusual. We, were, we are very lucky that we have these guidelines from WHO to, 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 to drive the development. But uh, they have uh, some constraints in these guidelines, as I was saying, 18 months follow-up. The outcome measure is based on the lumbar puncture, and that lumbar puncture has to be repeated at, at six months, at 12 months, and at 18 months. Just imagine you're suffering from a disease, you feel better, will you come back to get your lumbar puncture, which is painful, no anesthesia, nothing, just to be told, yes, you're right, you're feeling good, you are, you are cured. So it's, it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult challenge. That being said, for now, there's been little uh, literature and this is the way we need to go. Um, it's based on direct microscopy in the lab. At the time of the lumbar puncture, you have to move, you have 20 minutes, half an hour from the lumbar puncture to the microscope. So how do you make quality checks of all these things? Not a simple thing. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the non-inferiorities and again, the sites which are so far away and uh, I'll show you something about that later. So what we did was to have, uh, and these are the opportunities on the right side, is we went for scientific advice with a plan of uh, you know, a, a very solid uh, clinical uh, trial design, non-inferiority, rather high non-inferiority margin, but we explained why that was based on some um, surveys we had done with physicians. We're using a number of ongoing multiple futility analysis to be able to say, too bad, uh, we stop, we are blinded, sites are not blinded. We're trying to secure and you know, have good quality as much as we can. Uh, and uh, so far, it looks, uh, I mean, so far we're conducting this and this was uh, accepted by, uh, by the regulators. We're using, of course, we're trying to use an, an electronic CRF. So again, sounds very simple, not simple at all to have an electronic CRF when you can do, um, um, uh, where you can enter data um, when you're not online because usually most of the tools require an online system, no online system in the middle of DRC. And last and not least, we're trying to think and to use uh, some new modeling uh, um, techniques, modeling, uh, just modeling based on, on what has been published. So far, it's not very promising because there's few data and a model is working well when you can feed it with a lot of data. But anyway, we're trying to do that and see how this will help us in changing a little bit the designs. Um, in visceral leishmaniasis, it's a little different. Uh, we still have to do it, it's still a fatal disease. Here, I would say that, um, okay, the follow-up is long as well. It's based on, uh, the exam is based on uh, spleen or bone marrow aspirate to check that the patient has the disease. But then there are variabilities in the way people assess the efficacy. Sometimes they do bone marrow, sometimes they do spleen aspirate because depending on regions, not everybody agrees to use the same technique. Each has its liabilities. You can imagine, again, it's not, it's not uh, simple. Um, the follow-up is still, again, as I've said, long. Um, but the key thing, I think, for us is the fact that we have observed, um, sorry, I'm not sure you can read, some uh, very clear <clears throat> differences in efficacy using the same drugs. This disease is endemic in uh, India, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, and in East Africa and Latin America. And unfortunately, drugs which are very efficacious in India do not show the same level of efficacy in East Africa. And so far, we do not understand very well why. You would say probably you have good PK, you have parasite differences, you have, well, we have a little of each, but we have nothing very clear. So um, the other thing is that based on that, uh, and based on, there are some experts here who can say how uh, resistance can develop uh, uh, on, on leash with all the compounds that we have now. So the paradigm is that we should use combinations. So again, um, testing new NCs in combination is something rather new. Uh, there have been guidelines, but I haven't heard of many uh, diseases where this has been done. Of course, it's been done in AIDS, but it's, a, it's still a very a big challenge. And in fact, uh, FDA released a guideline two years back to develop uh, treatments for tuberculosis, in fact, in combination, new NCs. 
So I think we all feel that we need to understand a little more the host uh, immune response because growing evidence is suggesting that this may play a role in the different responses that uh, <coughs> regional, uh, well, patients have in the different regions. We know that there are parasite differences that has been established, but to what level this is enough to explain everything, we don't know. So we remain with a number of questions and I'm saying it's an opportunity. I think the opportunity is that we now understand that we, we can, we can um, uh, do some more research on the, uh, on the immune response. And uh, well, that's a new, uh, it's a new opportunity for us to better understand what's happening. So in, in that sense, it's rather positive. Um, another challenge which may be shared with uh, other diseases in East Africa is that um, in East Africa, VL is mostly endemic. 70% of patients are children. So, of course, for malaria, this is uh, not unknown, but it's uh, something to, to consider when you have to start with a totally new class of treatments. How quickly can you start including children, which will be, of course, usually you wait until you have um, sufficient uh, adult safety data. Um, I mentioned the combination. The other one, which I think is personally is a, is a big one, is how do you consider including uh, female patients um, who do not have access to contraception and uh, who uh, could be at risk of developing VL and how can you do that or, or just exclude them? Should you just exclude them? So what will be the uh, ultimate uh, outcome of not knowing how a drug uh, behaves pharmacologically and you know, pharmacodynamically in uh, female patients? And uh, it sounds probably bizarre to some of you, but we have been in situations where there were some drugs we could not test because these drugs had to be given with contraception. And so the, these uh, ma uh, female patients could not be included. So I think that's another one. Um, okay, oncocercaisis was mentioned this morning. This one is a disease where only doxycycline, we're developing and we're trying to develop a macrophylaricide. The only uh, macrophylaricide uh, uh, drug or macrophylaricide or activity drug is doxycycline, and we, we heard this morning how doxycycline works by having an indirect effect on Volbachia. So the effect of uh, doxycycline is is supposed to be long, and uh, and it's and it's supposed to be very helpful that it's long. But if we have if we want to try and use uh, a new macrophylaricide and test. How, the, how, the, how it works for a POC study of a new compound. How do you do that? Actually, the, uh, the worm is located in nodules, subcutaneous nodules, and uh, the only way you can know whether your drug is working or not is just extracting the nodule by a biopsy, opening up, and looking at worms. So if you do that on one or two nodules at month uh, three, for instance, you don't have the nodules to check that the effect would have been there at month six. Or you can still look at month six if you have other nodules, but you don't really know, you know. So it's a, it's a very difficult one. So of course, we're looking for a surrogate marker. And um, um, I think what is nice is that I think is linked also to the discussion about open, uh, open knowledge or sharing information. In fact, there is a group in France called Aviezan who's trying to put together different researchers from different areas. And we approached them. They were very interested in using a technique that they are developing um, to assess um, brain tumors, uh, <coughs> um, brain tumors uh, with, a, with a device that is external. And they were thinking that probably you could transfer some of this technology to be used in another area. And I, I think that's one of the things that we can benefit from because there's a lot of enthusiasm to try and work with us and, uh, and help us. There's also some research going on in, uh, in the field of biomarkers uh, by the Bonn University. And we hope that this will come because otherwise, again, for doxycycline, you have to wait. If we want to compare with doxycycline, we will have to wait 18 or 24 months to see the worm dying and showing that it's, uh, it's working. Another one, which is uh, across uh, diseases, which again um, is usually the type of thing people do not want to dig into because it's uh, difficult, is the, the, uh, the, the fact that we know <laughs> that uh, laboratory normal ranges that we use to test the safety of our drugs 
in fact, is probably very different. The normal ranges are probably very different in Africa than they are in the Caucasian population, or we know the Asian population, the Japanese population. We have a few ideas on, on metabolism. But here, on the, uh, the, the, the normal labs, we know not very much. This publication uh, was uh, done by some African researchers and shows uh, outside of the uh, hemoglobin values some differences in bilirubin, which seems to be uh, to be higher IgG uh, low uh, CPK, which is which is higher. Bon. We we don't know what the significance of this is, but what we know is the uh, the normal range is different. So again, if you want to do trials and make sure you do not stop a trial for um, exaggerated impression of safety signals, you have to understand what is the normal in these uh, in these regions. Um, so in terms of scientific challenges, I think. Um, progress is being made. We also discussed animal models. We, we had a, a very nice talk about the, the Shagas animal models recently, and there is some extremely uh, beautiful research ongoing, but it's not validated yet, because you also need to have your validation with an active drug. So it's a bit of a, of a, of a, of a circle there. Um, I think one of the things also that we, we understand, and I'm trying to be quick, but the, uh, the lack of understanding of how diseases develop, um, lack of clinical trials which can help in you know, making, having a, a benchmark for, for your clinical trial is, is, is there. So we have to continue uh, to work on that. Um, we don't have good that field uh, diagnosis, field adapted uh, diagnosis that we can use uh, well, just to select patients, and I can mention just the fact that to select sleeping sickness patients, you need to send, <coughs> excuse me, mobile teams which ha which have which will have to do sequential sequential um, number of lab examinations, which are very technically very requiring, very long, and uh, of course will will uh, depend on, on specific skills which you need to make sure that you will sustain over time. So not simple. Um, here, I think we mentioned uh, just before the value of data sharing platforms. And I'm talking here clinical data sharing platforms. Well, for neglected diseases, there's not much. There is one, which is uh, the database that has been established to better understand factors related to resistance of antimalarials and beyond. That is working very well, and I think we need to think a little more about doing exactly the same thing, just to understand and to collect the information on, on these different diseases. Um, I cannot expand too much, but you know, I think uh, you was also discussed how much clinical trial data should be shared or not be shared. It's probably a little different, but uh, because there are here uh, issues related to confidentiality, to uh, methodology, but I think the move is there and everybody is going into that direction. The only question will be, as was discussed this uh, morning, how much control do you want to have to sharing data and at what level, when will you share data? But it's pretty clear that it's a kind of win-win uh, situation and win-win pr process to generate this information that has been scattered around when it exists. So. We are, in terms of if we go back just to clinical development, we're just generating knowledge. I can, I can cite, for example, uh, the work that has been done uh, on PCR and uh, PCR and Chagas disease and uh, uh, work done in, uh, in Argentina uh, over 10 years cohort. And we, <coughs> so, so she did that, the research, I did that 10 years back and she had collected some samples. So we did PCR with her. We're trying to correlate the PCR uh, to the uh, to the ultimate uh, response, and in a way validate now the fact that PCR can be considered as a tool to measure the efficacy of a drug for Chagas disease. That's another one, and and having regulatory uh, consultations on 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 an ongoing way, just to make sure that the regulators and the policymakers understand why we are doing what we are doing is, I think, the best scenario for success. Um, if I may, I'd like just to show you this, because I think it speaks to itself. Patients over several years and convinced people before they were cured to go back to hospital every six months in order to have a lumbar puncture.
In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the healthcare teams are looking for patients who move around the forest without leaving an address. People said, there's nowhere a scientific study can be conducted in a country like the Congo. They said it wouldn't work. Hier, par exemple, un malade qui demeure un droit, j'ai fait au moins 400 km pour aller le chercher là-haut. Oui, en moto. Je suis allé même dans des églises. Et on m'a dit qu'elle est dans un village à 24 km de Moussambo. Donc c'était dans la forêt. Et il n'y a pas de route, pas moyen d'aller même avec moto ou bien vélo. J'ai fait les pieds. J'ai fait la ponction, j'ai prélevé le sang. Je suis rentré vite pour venir examiner. Cinq heures de marche. C'est la petite histoire qui montre heures. comment voilà, chacun est individuel, mais quand il y a des gens comme vous qui vraiment s'y prennent, voilà, et, et, et on, on, on réussit. Et bon, c'est ce qui était l'essentiel pour l'étude. On faisait cette étude pour montrer que le traitement était efficace et c'était la seule manière de le prouver. Donc, euh, ouais, chapeau, c'est impressionnant. Okay, and this is of course uh, reality. Uh, this is exactly um, this is this this was uh, about a study that um, uh, showed the efficacy of uh, uh, nifurtimoxifloridine, which was conducted by the NDI. Yeah. But it's uh, we're conducting a new study, and this will also happen now. Even though we have uh, now the mobile phones, which help in capturing, <laughs> making sure we know where the patients are, but we still need to go and look for the patients. So. This is, uh, in terms of the operational challenges, I think this one is self-illustrating, uh, but uh, what the NDI has done is really to use, uh, exist to use and to build uh, clinical trial platforms where we do a lot of uh, capacity strengthening, but we also do uh, use these platforms to build the TPP, the target product profile, which will ultimately drive the whole activities that we're doing. So. Um, no time to detail too much these platforms, but let's say that I think having a regional entity is something that is absolutely crucial to the success of any activities that we have because you are then connected with the needs, uh, not only in terms of science, but also in terms of understanding. We mentioned again this morning or this afternoon access uh, of the treatments. All of this is discussed at different levels in these platforms. So. Um, it is something that uh, we also use to, um, to conduct, a lot of training has been done, is done um, uh, all the time in these platforms. So you can see a training uh, on pharmacovigilance, you can see on the top right uh, training on cardiac resuscitation. That was done because when we started with this trial, Fixinidazole, we had no idea of what could happen in, in five years, for five hours from Kinshasa, and we thought it would be useful just in case something happened. First time we're testing a drug in patients, huh? uh, if they, if they, they had to, to use uh, uh, yeah, the electroshock. Of course, GCP and PCR training, that was in Cochabamba, but GCP is all, all over the time. And another the GCP training in, uh, in Haijipur, in Bihar, for, for a study, an implementation study in, in VIA. And I'll end up with the uh, regulatory challenges, again mentioned in the introduction this morning, so <laughs> we're sort of closing the day with this. First of all, I'll start with some ethical challenges. I, I think we know that we are working with vulnerable patients, and we know and we are conscious that some of these patients by entering in a clinical trial, we'll get access to a treatment. So I, I think as long as we know that, it means we know what precautions and we know that we need to think about precautions so that it's, we're not inducing uh, uh, participation to a trial and we're trying to find the best equitable way of, of uh, um, reimbursing uh, patients when they come, etc and uh, not making this uh, reimbursement as an inducement and also making sure that we consider patients who are not entering in a clinical trial because that we have been we have been told by the field that we had to be very clear on this uh, of course no time but uh, the informed consent uh, process if we want it to be informed we have to consider where we are working with whom uh, include the culture there include the fact that not many of the patients were, were entering in clinical trials are literate patients. Um, 
we have to understand the, the constraints that these patients might be, uh, might be having. So all of this requires careful thinking and, and contact with the field. In HIV, you know the role of community engagement. Um, and again, I had mentioned the, uh, the pediatric population and the women of childbearing age, and also those who are uh, of childbearing age but uh, not, uh, not married or young, uh, again, because they depend on someone else to consent for them, and that when we talk about sexuality and contraception, it becomes sometimes difficult. The other l last thing uh, related to the conditions where we are in the countries is that there isn't any social security. So uh, we need to understand that, and you know, we, we, we have some requests to pay for some of the, uh, maybe uh, some of the uh, injuries that could come not related to clinical trials, so how do we address this? Um, and it's a valid question. So in terms of purely regulatory review of clinical trials, it's finished then. I think the resource vary. Uh, you know that uh, the, uh, the timing uh, of, the, uh, of the review can be extremely different. There, there are some duplications between ethics committee and regulatory uh, authorities. This uh, chart, uh, I have an anonymized it on purpose, but it shows uh, it's work done by the different PDPs. We looked at how long it took basically to get approval. It can be one month, it can be 18 months, it can be three years, basically. And uh, you can see differences, light and blue, so countries are on the horizontal axis, and uh, light and dark blue re represent uh, ethics and regulatory ethics in dark and national regulatory authorities in light. So again, variability, and that is basically because there, are, there aren't any resources there. So we published two reports uh, trying to understand, address, advocate for, for different uh, approaches. And the positive note here is that there are a lot of things happening in this field. Uh, there are a lot of capacity strengthening initiatives. Oli just mentioned the ones from uh, EDCTP trying to strengthen uh, ethics review of clinical trials and ethics um, committees, even co um, building ethics committees. The African Medicine Regulatory Harmonization process supported by, uh, by DFID, by World Bank, by the Gates Foundation is trying to set a number of activities to, to, to engage countries to work together in harmonization and to develop centers of excellence and uh, <clears throat> do a lot of training. Um, joint reviews of clinical trials have already happened in the field of vaccines. Um, under the umbrella of AVAREF with EDCTP and WHO. Uh, there is an initiative that is a, a, a European one, which is the Article 58 of EMA, uh, which uh, essentially assesses products that will be um, developed for, for endemic countries and where there will not be a marketing authorization request for Europe. And we also can go for scientific advice. And the value of this is that it is done jointly with WHO and endemic countries. So that, I think, is a, is a wonderful um, initiative. Again, AMRH is looking at uh, collaborative uh, approaches. And recently, there was an FDA breakthrough designation, which is also trying to accelerate uh, the, the uh, access of a treatment. So I'm mixing a little bit uh, clinical trials reviews and approvals. but. These, uh, these bodies are doing both. So in conclusion, um, there are still some questions. I mentioned a few, but I think there are some opportunities. It's doable. All these initiatives are here. I'm showing a PKPD because for us it's new on the left, top left. We can see a new knowledge. We, we uh, a pharmacologist working with us generated trying to understand why uh, Ambisome uh, was not working in one dose and was wor working more in several. So some, some PD information we did not have to tell you how far we are. Sometimes it could look very basic, but this is new. There are some guidances coming. Uh, I think today we, uh, we saw the press release, uh, which is here about the green light for a 15 minute test for sleeping sickness. So something totally different from what we usually, we had in the field where they have to use all these uh, techniques and uh, we're going to publish something on ethics review. So anyway, just to say that I think, I uh, don't know if I addressed this, but I think in the future, 
we should go back to the slide I presented and probably in five or 10 years time show that it's not 3.8% of products that are developed for neglected diseases, but we have increased or doubled that minimum. Thank you very much.